today I am so excited to be bringing you Dr. Nikki Rollo. Dr. Nikki Rollo is the National Director and Co-Founder of Reasons Eating Disorder Center. She got her PhD in depth psychology and is also a licensed marriage family therapist and is going to be talking about a topic that is very near and dear to my heart and I think anybody who's going through the recovery process and that is the healing power of compassion focused therapy. So without further ado, Dr. Dr. Nikki Rollo, thank you so much for being with us here today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to talk with you today about this topic. That is that part of your guys' philosophy is using compassion in the healing process? Yeah, yeah. There's a, a huge emphasis on, um, on compassion and in part because we are working with shame. And so we know that one of the one of the best ways to work with shame is to um, build that muscle of compassion and self compassion in people who are going through the recovery journey. Well, I'm so excited for everybody to see the amazing interactive presentation that you put together <laughs> on this. So let's uh, hop in. If I know okay. you're there. <laughs> All right, let's go. So I'm really happy to be here today, and I think whether you're listening in as a clinician or a person on the recovery journey, um, I think it's a safe assumption that a lot of us have an interest in this idea of, of the pursuit of healing. And um, for clinicians, we're often initiated into the healing profession through our own wounds, and we have to do our own work to stay healthy and well hydrated in our body and mind in order to walk with our clients through the, the terrain of their inner landscape. And for people that are on the path to recovery, I'm really hoping that what I share today makes an impact on, on your pursuit as well. I think this is a topic that is applicable to both clinicians and people on the recovery journey and really just anyone. This idea of compassion and self-compassion, I think, is um, something that we all just need a lot more of in this world, regardless of where we are on our path. Um, and these things have really made an impact on me in my clinical work, but also in my own healing, healing journey. Um, so I thought I would start with looking at these ideas of health and healing and happiness. And I think they're often kind of held out to us in these nicely wrapped kind of promotional quick fix packages. And so I thought I would start with one of the places that we all turn to looking for answers. And um, that is Google, right? <laughs> Probably one of the places that we oftentimes say, all right, if I, if I need to know something, I'm, I'm going to Google it. So I wanted to see what Google had to say about um, healing. And this is what I found. There are 10 tips for emotional healing. Um, there's also five tips. Um, there are you, a way that you can heal yourself um, in, let's see, you can heal yourself with your mind for real. Uh, you can um, find three steps or seven steps to healing yourself. Um, and you can heal yourself in an instant, right? In five minutes or less. And uh, there's emotional healing for dummies. And there are a thousand plus ideas on emotional healing on Pinterest. Um, so I'm not saying that any of these ideas are bad or that there's not really great things in them or that the people who wrote them don't have like really great points. And I'm also not claiming to have the real answer to healing. But I think what this illuminates is that there's a real human need that's important and understandable at a really deep desire, a really deep level and deep desire for, for healing. Um, and this is just one sampling of all the things that are found on the internet about healing. And um, so today I want to spend our time in this, in this space of exploring one specific aspect, and that is the, the aspect of compassion and self-compassion. Um, but I do think that this this aspect of healing kind of um, impacts all the other areas of, um, you know, for example, people who are struggling with an eating disorder, there's, um, there's different things that we need to do, right? There's nutritional restoration or medical stabilization, um, exposure work, all of those things. And I think that compassion and self-compassion, having that as a really well-developed 
part of yourself can um, help you enter into those other aspects of the healing work um, with a little bit more, a little bit more ease. Um, I think it takes great courage to do the work of self-compassion and engaging in therapy that's, that's focused on that. So for many of us, the call to compassion is a journey into the unknown, right? It's just, it's territory that we're not familiar with. And um, it takes great courage to consciously move towards wholeness with a mindful presence, willing to meet your own darkness and retrieve the rejected parts of you with a compassionate attitude. Extending yourself with kindness to the weaker parts of who you are. And um, there's a quote from Jung, now it's kind of long, um, and there is some, um, some kind of religious language in it, but I'd like to just kind of pay attention to the spirit of the quote, because this is the space that we're going to be in today. And he says, perhaps this sounds very simple, but simple things are always the most difficult. In actual life, it requires the greatest discipline to be simple. And the acceptance of oneself is the essence of a moral problem and the epitome of a whole outlook upon life. That I feed the hungry, that I forgive an insult, that I love my enemy in the name of Christ. All these are undoubtedly virtues. What I do unto the least of my brethren, that I do unto Christ. But what if I should discover that the least amongst them, the poorest of beggars, the most impudent of all the offenders, the very enemy himself, that these are within me that I myself stand in need of the alms of my own kindness, that I myself am the enemy who must be loved. What then? Wow, that's powerful. Oh, right? <laughs> yeah. So today we're kind of in the space of what then, right? Because I think that um, so many of us um, have that inner critic voice, right? And um, we find that... Um, we might think of ourselves actually as the enemy. So the question is, what then? Um, and that brings us to why compassion? Uh, the answer to this is a simple phrase, but also a really complex concept. And the, why compassion? Because suffering exists. Uh, ancient wisdom from a lot of religions and spiritual traditions really tells us that this principle of compassion is the way through our suffering and pain and the hardships that we endure as humans. And so I want to take a moment to explore this concept of suffering and explain what framework I'm operating from when I use this word. Um, there's two kind of fundamental uh, assumptions that I think I'm going to be kind of operating from that I think is important for you to know as we're diving into this together. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but I just want to bring this into our consciousness as we move through the material. And the first is that we all have an impulse or a drive towards healing. The idea of actively seeking healing, of course, assumes that there's a wound, right? That there's some kind of pain or discomfort. And um, I think we can agree that we live in a world where people are in a lot of pain and there's a lot of suffering. Uh, but we have an impulse or a drive to end it. Mm -hmm. uh, oftentimes what this looks like for us, though, is avoiding, right? Turning away from it, trying to get as far away from it as we possibly can, right? Like that's how we're, I, I need this to stop. I have to get away from it. But what we're going to discover today is that compassion and self-compassion actually ask something really different of us, um, which is a, a turning toward. Um, and so we'll get into that a little bit more. And the second thing is that our symptoms are an expression of a deeper wound and that they're actually an attempt at balance or regulation. They're warning signs that something needs to be paid attention to at a deeper level. And so they can be an entry point into the healing path, right? They can, the, the symptoms and the wound can actually initiate us onto a, a healing journey. Um, we're, we're oftentimes kind of looking for some way to heal um, our, our loneliness, our isolation, an eating disorder, addiction, broken relationships. And, um, and so I think that, that self-compassion is going to be um, a really interesting way for us to think about um, how, think about our symptoms and think about our wounds in a, in a way that is uh, different from avoiding or running from or turning away from. I can't even begin to explain how important this all is. <laughs> like, 
<laughs> I'm loving every minute of it. Yeah, it's really exciting, um, but also um, it's such hard work. And so I want to keep emphasizing that <laughs> kind of through the whole thing is yeah. that it takes courage, right? Because I think sometimes when we think about self-compassion, it can kind of feel like fluffy um, or easy or, some, or, you know, we're kind of letting ourselves off the hook um, if we're nice to ourselves. Um, but the reality is that this takes a, a lot of courage. It's really the way of the warrior, I would say. Is this, this yeah, question. it is. It is. Um, and so you, you might notice I'm using this word suffering and I'm going to use it throughout the talk. Um, and I think that um, the, there's uh, maybe some people might not relate to that word, but there's some reasons why I'm using it. And um, I think that particularly in the clinical population of people diagnosed with an eating disorder, that suffering can show up in the form of really high levels of shame. And um, the Buddhist tradition has a lot of teachings on suffering. And so I'm going to take a minute to just kind of broadly review those to get a sense of what suffering is, because I think we might borrow some of these ideas to, to guide us during the talk and better help us understand the um, need for and applicability of compassion for people who are struggling with a really shame-based identity. Um, so there's four noble truths, right? And the first is that suffering exists. And the Buddhist thought identifies three different kinds of suffering. One is physical, right? If you're ill or injured or chronic disease, lack of sleep, hunger. Um, the second is emotional. If there's injustices, you feel betrayed or anxiety about losing someone that you love or feeling a lack of purpose. And the third is change, worry and anxiety about the impermanence of life, right? That everything is changing all the time and a feeling like there's not solid footing, like I can't really rely on anything. Um, and the second thing is that suffering has a cause. And the, the idea here is that <clears throat> the cause of suffering is the way that our mind reacts to pain. Um, if we have unmet needs or desires or unsatisfied wants, or if we're just hanging on or gripping, too tightly to something. And uh, there's some hope, right? The third is that suffering can end or it can be significantly reduced, right? Um, and that there is, the fourth is that there's a path and the path of freedom from suffering is one of understanding and action and mindfulness and compassion actually as part of the, the path. Um, there's actually a whole eightfold path, which we won't really get into at all today. Um, but compassion is one of the aspects of moving through um, suffering. Um, so the question is, how do we react to suffering, right? Do we avoid it or do we engage with it? I think overall, we want to decrease and, and reduce our suffering and our instinct is to turn away. Um, and we're really quick to judge ourselves and withhold compassion and self-forgiveness. Um, it's easier for us to see beauty and goodness in someone else than in ourselves overall. And I think sometimes we say things that are beyond mean, but actually cruel to ourselves. Um, and so what we're going to be doing today is talking about how do we really engage in really what's an alchemical journey of transforming metal into gold or transforming what is poisonous right into what can be life-giving how do we use our pain and suffering and um, apply self-compassion to it and and transform that so we have fuel for health and love and meaning and purpose in our lives um, so let's just take a closer look at shame really quickly before we move into compassion um, Let's see, I think that um, I've said it before, but people with eating disorders are so often suffering from really profound shame. And I think it's important to understand the layers of this. So they may be um, experiencing shame of behaviors, right? Of, um, of maybe engaging in specific things. There also might be shame of being in treatment, um, shame of being a burden on someone else. And significantly, I think this is important to understand that oftentimes there's a deep, deep shame of your very kind of existence in the world of taking up, up space, of breathing. Um, and so the thing that 
is often used for coping with that kind of suffering and pain, right? The eating disorder then becomes the cause of more suffering and shame. So it's kind of layered. Um, and the, the feeling here is a really powerful emotion. And it's not just about kind of being embarrassed um, or, um, you know, humiliated in some way, but it's really about that feeling that something about us is wrong and defective or inadequate. And um, it, you know, it's something that um, we all experience from time to time, um, but I think the level of it for people who are struggling with an eating disorder is really profound. Um, Brene Brown did some research on shame and the participants in her study used some words that I think are, are really powerful. They used words like devastating, um, consuming, excru excruciating, trapped, powerless, isolated. That feeling that one is fundamentally flawed or defective and there's a wish to disappear because you just feel so small or worthless or unworthy and um, uh, you know the feeling that you um, you don't deserve and I think um, that I think it's important for us to really understand kind of what that feels like um, in order to in order to see how the work of compassion or self-compassion is actually so difficult and so courageous right with the intensity of the shame that we are using the self-compassion to impact um, it I think shows that this kind of suffering that we're turning towards is intense and that that requires a lot of um, a lot of compassion and a lot of courage and the antidote to shame is like we've been talking about self-compassion and I love this quote from Christopher Germer who says a moment of self-compassion um, can change your entire day and a string of those kinds of moments can change the course of your life. What I think is so important is how you touched on shame being this kind of harder to touch emotion and like the depth mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. So many people can cannot verbalize that sensation you're saying, just this feeling of unworthiness and it it's almost like the anxiety where I had the realization around anxiety. It's like the stress, the overwhelm, can't do it enough. Like all these things, it's like, that's anxiety. Right. And shame is just another one of those turning points in my recovery to see this was the shame. And it just wasn't a word that would come up to describe the sensation or the feeling or the state mm -hmm. of mind. Right. Yeah. And it can be a hard word to even verbalize, um, to, um, to, uh, say okay that I'm I'm um, having a shame-based experience right now right because that in itself can feel shaming <laughs> in <laughs> right? that place right so it's just it's really really layered yeah it is so let's get into um, into the self-compassion so um, let's start with the definition of compassion and this is a Buddhist definition of compassion and it's two parts so the first is that there's a sensitivity to suffering and um, the second is that there is a, um, a motivation or commitment to alleviate it somehow. Um, and compassion actually means to feel with. So um, when we think about self-compassion, we're taking these things and then turning them inward towards ourself. And I wanna um, look at uh, Kristen Neff's research and her work on self-compassion. I think it sets up a good foundation to talk about a compassion-focused therapy or focusing on self-compassion in the therapeutic process. Um, and I, I think it's also important to just say that I think self-compassion answers this question of how to relate to ourselves gently and start to reduce that suffering of self-hate and shame and, and criticism. Um, so Kristen Neff has her own definition of self-compassion, and that is an attitude of kindness, acceptance towards one's personal distress and disappointments. And her research has also shown that self-compassion is linked to less depression, greater happiness, and more overall life satisfaction. And resilience too, right? That was another yes. sign that I found interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and 
I love this this image that um, someone there's a, a resource down here, seerwords.com, that someone created from Kristen Neff's um, research. And there's three um, she has three aspects and core kind of core components of self compassion. And the first is um, self kindness, right? And this asks that we offer a gentleness in language and an understanding towards ourselves. So instead of that harsh criticism or judgment, we're gonna actively stop to soothe ourselves when we're in pain. Um, and we're not saying stop feeling like this, or you know, it's not um, trying to stop the thought, but it's offering ourselves understanding instead of punishment when we're feeling that way. And the second one is common humanity, a recognition of our connection with others. And I think this is also really important for people in the recovery journey because um, eating disorders can be so isolating and they can really be maintained in isolation. But this idea is that rather than sinking into isolation, we're recognizing that uh, suffering and imperfection is a shared human experience. Um, everyone goes through some form of suffering. And the third is mindfulness, and we're holding a balanced awareness of our experiences in life. So we don't want to ignore our pain, or we don't want to um, put a magnifying glass on it or amplify it in some way. Um, so we're not ignoring or exaggerating, but being fully present in the moment. Um, her work also emphasizes the difference between self-esteem, which is judging yourself positively, and self-compassion, which is relating to yourself kindly. And her research shows that um, it's important that we let go of self-criticism, but really what, what she goes on to say is that we let go of this as a problem. So we need to have compassion for our inner critic. Um, so instead of trying to stop that voice, we have compassion for that voice. Because what it's trying to do or what it has a desire to do is to keep us safe, right? In some way, it's trying to keep us safe and loved and accepted and it's coming from a place of care, but somehow along the way it's been twisted. And so we can ask the questions, why is this here? How is it trying to help me? How is this trying to keep me safe? Um, when we see a flaw in ourselves, we, we feel threatened um, and we see it as a really big problem. And then we, we go to the problem is me. And then we start attacking ourselves. And so her work is, um, offering us a, a different way of engaging with, um, with those things when it happens. And she gives a few specific ways to really engage in the process. And I think these are, um, these are really useful, super practical things that, that we can look at and use ourselves. And the first is just recognizing a moment of suffering. Um, and recognizing that, okay, I'm suffering right now. This is so difficult to be in this much shame. It's just so difficult, just acknowledging it. Um, and then you might draw on one of those other principles, right? Like maybe the common humanity, like it's so difficult to be in this level of shame right now. Um, but I know that everyone suffers and there's other people out there that um, I might be able to connect with that are going through something similar that might understand what's happening with me. I'm not alone in this. Um, and then she suggests extending a physical gesture to yourself. Um, we're designed to respond to soothing touch. So it might be something like hands on your heart, conveying kind of warmth and care to yourself. Um, and just taking a minute to breathe with your hands on your heart, a physical gesture of kindness and, and love and care. Uh, and the third is offering words of support. And it can be helpful if you, you know, when you have your hands on your heart to say, so sorry, it's hard right now. You can, um, you can rely on me. I've got you. I'm here. Something that you would say to a friend, right? Or a child who's in distress. Um, so you're actively um, touching your body in some way that feels soothing and then verbally saying, I got you. I'm so sorry, this is hard. It's just hard. Um, and so that's a really kind of practical, live way of starting to bring a self-compassionate approach to, um, to the situation that you're 
into the moment, wherever it is. And that's something that you can do um, probably without anybody even noticing, even in a public space, you would probably be able to engage in that practice. I find that I naturally, I've been practicing this for years now, and I'll naturally just put my hand over my heart. Mm. It's just so comfortting. One time for person asked if I was having heartburn, because <laughs> I was like, no, I'm just practicing self-compassion. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's funny. Um, so I think it's important for us to look at what blocks self-compassion as well, right? There's a lot of um, a lot of things that can um, pop up to try to keep us from engaging in this in this process. And one of the things could be um, maybe anger towards ourselves, right? Thinking that we don't deserve it or, or feeling uh, really upset with ourselves that we've messed up in some way. Um, our belief system, right? That somewhere along the way, we concluded that we're worthless or unlovable or don't deserve this. Um, shame, like we've been talking about. And that's the difficult thing is self-compassion is this antidote to shame. Um, and it's, we may believe that this actually makes us weak. And then we feel hesitate, hesitant and engaging in, in the um, process of self-compassion, right? We think, oh, it's a cop-out. It's an excuse for being mediocre. Mm -hmm. um, and really what this means is that when we're experiencing these kind of blocks, it means our threat system it, see, it may be overactive, right? And it actually needs to be soothed. We have to deliberately foster and grow new patterns on ourselves that soothe that threat system. And we do this by learning to pay attention and practicing mindfulness, becoming curious about our feelings instead of being frightened of them. Um, and so I'm starting to answer this, this next question here of what, um, what unblocks self-compassion. Um, and the first is you know, curiosity. Um, and, you know, we really just have to be curious about the possibility that something could be different, that maybe the self-compassion thing, I don't know, maybe they're onto something there, you know, like maybe there's something in that that could maybe open up a different pathway for me. Um, and the second is, is courage, which is tolerating fear in order to face the pain, right? Because this, this can be really scary. Um, and the third is, is mindfulness, really setting the stage and getting us ready and tuned in and paying attention with a calm mind, a mind at peace with itself, so you can think clearly and develop new insights and relationships to, your, to others and to food and to yourself. Um, and this is where compassion-focused therapy comes in. It can be a really useful framework to integrate into, um, into the journey. Um, and compassion focused therapy really is about training your brain. So it was developed by um, a man named Paul Gilbert in the UK. And there's a lot of really great resources that he has, not only for therapists, but also um, for people that just want to explore these practices on their own um, or have, you know, books to read while they're practicing these things um, within the context of a therapeutic relationship. Um, so I would encourage you to um, to kind of check him out, and I'm also happy to to give more resources um, about his work. But I first came upon it when I was um, doing some research on body image and shame, and it made a lot of sense to me because I think if we think about eating disorders as um, disorders of shame, and that the antidote to shame is is self compassion then um, I think we need to be spending a lot more time developing and training our brains to be self-compassionate. And this therapy was developed for people with high levels of shame and, and self-criticism. Self um, and so CFT kind of takes elements of the Buddhist compassion, um, combines it with some cognitive behavioral therapy, um, a little bit of Jungian depth psychology, and um, and some um, kind of evolutionary or um, neuroscience um, kinds of perspectives as well. Um, and um, it's, a, I think, a really beautiful kind of adjunct to, um, to treatment or, you know, integrating it into other therapies that, um, that you might be engaged in. So the idea is that instead of rejecting one part of life and 
grasping or reaching for another, this idea of compassion moves us closer to the whole of life, right? The dark and the light parts of it. And how we relate to ourselves affects our ability to get through life's challenges. Um, our brains have evolved in amazing ways. Um, you know, it used to be just about survival, right? But now we're capable of, of imagination, which is amazing. And at the same time, we're also capable of rumination, right? So um, we get really anxious about things now. Um, so compassion-focused therapy um, is meant to kind of address that. So I'll dive in a little bit to um, what it is. And um, we'll start with the three with the circles. So there's a, a few different kinds of circle models that are used in compassion focused therapy. Um, there's three processes. The first is being open to um, helpfulness and compassion from others, and then being helpful and compassionate towards others, and then developing uh, a compassionate approach to yourself. Um, <clears throat> Now, Nikki, is this something that you have as part of the program, the residential and inpatient program at Reasons? Yeah, so a few of our, a few of our therapists and program managers have been exposed to this model and use it specifically with um, working with like shame resilience. Because I can see it being cool to be in the treatment setting and working on this idea of helpfulness to others and yes. towards uh, like from others and towards others in a, in a less kind of, um, how do you say it? it, it it's a nice starting point to then go out to the real world or like the, and be able to then practice it there more. Yeah, I mean, that's the, one of our goals in the treatment center is to provide as much kind of real life practice within the, within the center, right? Within the safety of that. Um, before you go out and do it in your other relationships, right? So, um, yeah, so that idea of, of uh, what you're saying is really important in treatment. But this is still something that someone can do an outpatient as well, this type yes. of Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. This um, And this model, because um, it was developed in the UK, um, they, uh, they have various like outpatient models where... Um, they're using this in, um, in group work on an outpatient basis or just with a therapist, that kind of thing. So I think um, this is something that can be used in conjunction with a lot of other therapies. Um, and it's really applicable in either in inpatient or residential or in outpatient work. Um, and I, you know, I think, I think that, um, the the materials that Paul Gilbert has are really accessible to people. I think that's one of the really beautiful things about it is that um, it's not just kind of all in um, therapist jargon that people can't connect to and relate to, but it's really accessible work. Um, and yeah, um, he there's a few things about the model that I think are are important, and um, the the one of the foundational things is this three circle model and it's looking at um, ways that we regulate our emotions and the idea with, that cft puts forward is that we can understand ourselves better by understanding our our brains and so the first if we look down at the bottom in the red is our threat and detection system right and in people with eating disorders this can be activated around themes of size or shape or weight, um, hunger and fullness, we're designed to spot a threat and deal with it really quickly. So for example, um, when, if we're struggling with body image, we might do things like avoid a mirror or um, engage in something to uh, uh, fix our appearance really quickly, right? So we, can, we know we can do something to kind of take care of the anxiety that we're feeling in the moment even though that's not addressing kind of the deeper issue of um, either body neutrality or moving towards uh, body acceptance in some way. Um, so that's what this system is designed to do, is we feel threatened about something and we take care of it really quick. Um, and for example, like disgust is associated with this system. So, um, you know, if, if you're 
you think about, you know, being a caveman and eating a poison berry, you're going to be disgusted by it and you're not going to eat it again. So you don't die. Um, but as this, that, so that can actually, you know, become problematic for us when we, um, try to, um, avoid something or just kind of take care of it really quickly because we're not talking about poison berries, right? We're talking about something much more kind of complicated now. Um, like for instance, this is why body image is more complicated than just, I feel fat, but maybe it can be like, I, I hate my body. I'm, I'm disgusted by it. Um, and I want to, I want to eradicate it. I want to get rid of it. I don't want to be in this anymore. Um, that's the kind of the, Kind of connecting back to shame that we were talking about before. Um, and even compassion can be a threat, right? So um, this part of ourselves may experience all of this compassion work as a threat and, and be really fearful of it. Um, and the, so we'll move to the, the blue circle. And this is um, connected with our um, achievement, right? This system motivates us to survive and seek food and clothing and shelter. Um, and then the green is our contentment and um, soothing system. And that can be activated by particular foods, right? Or having compassion for eating or compassion for our emotions, connected to our sense of community, our spiritual beliefs, um, our courage. You know, it's a real, it's really about slowing down. And the goal is for the compassion itself to be the organizing principle. So um, we want it to be kind of what um, modulates all of these different systems. So in, um, in the, the drive or kind of achievement oriented place, we might engage in mindful acts of kindness, right? That might be our doing is that we're, you know, we're engaging in, in kindness. Um, in the threat system, we might be still feeling those things, but instead we're gonna have mindful, compassionate awareness of the triggers and feelings in our body. Um, it doesn't mean that we never feel those things, but it's, we respond to them from the compassion itself. Um, and then the, the affiliative kind of contentment system, the green circle, we're stable, we're calm, we're grounded, we're, we're engaging in um, deep breathing practice, that kind of thing. It's interesting how they affect the different uh, hormones. Yeah, yeah. Um, the other circle, there's a lot of circles. Um, the other circle is the circle of compassion. And you see this where it says warmth all in the corners. And you can imagine that as, as the therapeutic context, right? The therapeutic relationship or the therapeutic environment. Um, that there's a lot of, the idea is that there's a lot of warmth in this, in this kind of therapy. Um, and then some of the key attributes of compassion, right? Sensitivity, um, awareness of suffering rather than avoiding it. We are caring for well-being, um, sympathy, right? And that's, um, we're emotionally moved by the distress and joy of others, but also self to self, right? That can also be about extending that towards ourself. Um, distress tolerance. Um, so you can see that there's kind of pieces of other kinds of therapy in this as well. Um, Non-judgment, warmth, and then some of the skills, right, are thinking, right? How do we relate to our thoughts mindfully and cultivate compassionate ways of thinking? And we have attention. So we want to have compassionate awareness. Imagery. Um, where we cultivate a compassionate version of ourselves, right? So we actually kind of do a guided imagery exercise where we develop um, a compassionate version of ourselves that we would want to be. It doesn't mean that you have to be in that place now or even feel connected to that, but it would be a desire. What kind of image would I create of the most compassionate version of myself? Um, and we cultivate compassionate feelings like kindness, courage, safeness. And the behavior piece is, how do I cope? What do I do? What can I do that is compassionate? What is the next thing I can do for myself that is, self, that is um, an expression of self-compassion? And there's five different phases in this kind of therapy. So the first one is providing a lot of education and having conversations about how do our brains work? 
um, that this isn't, um, you know, feeling high levels of self-criticism or shame isn't your fault. Um, it's just, it's a response that we have as humans. And, and then we start to really formulate, um, you know, what early life experiences shaped the way that we um, think about things, right? Are there kind of core memories that we have about our sense of self? And uh, we cultivate uh, compassionate capacities through breathing, calming the body, working with emotions of kindness and joy and hope and building that compassion itself, like I was talking about before with imagery. Um, and um, then the last is engaging with, with specific problems, right? So how do I take this and relate it to anxiety? How do I take this and relate it to eating? Um, how do I use my compassionate self to have new experiences? And again, have a compassionate view of the inner critic, right? Because that voice might not go away in the beginning. Um, and honestly, all throughout life, things might pop up where we have negative thoughts, right? And so how do we have um, an, a compassionate um, attitude towards our inner critic? And so I thought that we could end by um, maybe practicing one of the one or two of the compassion um, experiential exercises if we have if we That'd have be great. Yeah. That. Okay. It. So one of the really, um, one of the foundational things of compassion focused therapy is the soothing breathing rhythm. Um, and so I thought it would be great if we kind of did that and then um, we'll move into finding our compassionate color to, to end together. Okay. Right. Um, so you can kind of sit comfortably with both feet flat on the floor um, it's nice to have them about shoulder width apart with your back kind of straight and supported. You want, you want to feel comfortable but upright because the idea is to be relaxed and alert rather than, rather than sleepy. Um, and gently close your eyes and allow your gaze to fall kind of maybe unfocused on the floor or you can close your eyes if you feel comfortable doing that. Um, and just create a gentle facial expression um, as if you're kind of you're with somebody that you like um, and you might relax your facial muscles let your jaw drop a little bit and then start to tune into your breathing and the air coming in through your nose and down into your diaphragm staying just a short while moving back out through your nose notice how your diaphragm moves gently as you breathe in and out and for the development of a soothing breathing rhythm, you'll breathe slightly more slowly and slightly more deeply than you normally would. Maybe your in-breath is about three to five seconds, and then you pause, and then take three to five seconds for the out-breath. And then you want to speed it up. So now you want to breathe a little faster than you normally would. And then somewhere in between that faster than you normally would and slower than you normally would, start to find a breathing pattern that's comfortable for you and has a gentle rhythm to it. Giving you the feeling of slowing down and finding a rhythm of breath. Focus on the out breath and the air leaving your nose and try to make the in breath and out breath even, right? That's the rhythm. And as you develop your own breathing rhythm, notice the feeling of inner slowing with each out breath. Notice how your body responds to your breathing as if you're linking up with a rhythm within your body that is soothing and calm for you. Notice how you might feel more grounded sitting on your chair, more solid or more still in your body. And you might find thoughts popping into your mind, which is completely okay and natural. Don't worry about it. You don't wanna to attempt to kind of get rid of those thoughts or make your mind go blank. You're not doing anything other than just focusing on the soothing breathing rhythm. 
and you don't have to become involved with the thoughts that pop into your mind, but you can kind of let them go free. You don't have to suppress them or really deeply engage with them. They can just, they can be there. Your mind can wander if it needs to. You just notice that and then you bring it back um, to your soothing breathing rhythm. And now as we're here in this place, imagine a color or colors that you might associate with compassion and a color that might convey a sense of warmth or kindness. This might be a light or fog or mist, or it could be swirling color, or it could be a combination of colors, or it might just be fleeting. But see if you can start to imagine this color or um, fog of colors or swirl of colors just surrounding you. Imagine the color entering through your heart area and slowly spreading through your body. Think of this as filled with qualities of wisdom, strength, warmth, and kindness. And see if you can hold a soft and friendly facial expression and attitude as you do this exercise. And now as you imagine the color flowing through you, it is only focused on helping you, strengthening you, and supporting you. Imagine that it flows around your body and it soothes and softens any areas of difficulty, pain, or tension you might be experiencing. If any blocks or barriers arrive, arise, and, and they might be connected to feelings of not deserving the support or kindness or thinking that this is too fluffy or this is a cop out, just recognize these things as distractions, their intrusions, and then mindfully go back to focusing on your compassionate color. If the distractions and intrusions seem overwhelming, just look at them with a smile and go back to that soothing breathing rhythm, trying to stay with it the best you can. Allowing that compassionate color to move throughout your body and around your body, holding you and supporting you. And then start to gently bring yourself back into the room, maybe engaging more with the sound of my voice. Opening your eyes or focusing them more as you feel comfortable. and taking just a quick moment to think about how you might um, bring that color or swirl of colors um, into your life somehow, maybe um, grabbing colored pencils or crayons or paint or something and, and doing some kind of expression of that and keeping it somewhere um, in your room or in your office. That's just a reminder of self-compassion um, in front of you. Right. Mm, that was really nice. Yeah. So I just want to thank you for having me and leave with the loving kindness meditation. May you be well, may you be free from suffering, may you flourish, and may you find peace. Mm. Nikki, this is amazing. Wow. Thank you. Thank may you continue to do this amazing work <laughs> on planet Earth. <laughs> Oh, wow. Yeah, thanks for having space for all of this today. I know it was a lot of information, but also wanting to, I love that you have hold space for the experiential practice as well and, and allow that to come into, um, come into this. Yeah, and I don't know if it was because of the presentation or not, but my color was, my compassionate color was that one there, kind of that magenta fuchsia color. Oh, really? Um, yeah, that one, and that one really was very very beautiful and mm. almost like mixed in with the aurora borealis too it was, oh. it was cool though that you gave it where it wasn't just a solid color there's room for other mm -hmm. elements and kind of combinations and fog yeah. like that was really that was really yeah cool. it can have a quality to it right it doesn't have to just be an image but it can it can be a fog or dense or you know you can yeah. be in it or it can be around you whatever yeah very cool. Mm -hmm. well,
thank you so much for, for teaching us this, this idea around self-compassion. For me, it was a game changer in my recovery. Mm -hmm. And I learned about it somewhat later. And if I would have had resources like this available when I was really in the height of my eating disorder, I can't even uh, really comprehend how that would have changed where I was at with my mm -hmm. inner critic and mm -hmm. the, the practice of self-compassion. So mm -hmm. for anybody who was listening to this and did have doubts, like you were saying, like, do you find that clients come in doubting that self-compassion? Oh, yeah. Word? That's like to be expected. <laughs> yeah, that you're going to doubt it and you're going to think this is either this is ridiculous or this is completely going to make me mediocre. I cannot let myself off the hook like this. It's yeah. the opposite. It really helps you get to where you want to be without the struggle as like, well, the suffering, like you're saying, is, is there, it's part of our lives. But what do you think about the quote that pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional? Do, do you think that that's true, that suffering is optional or with compassion, it can start to get to a point where it's not as common? Yeah, I think you can shift it, but I do think, I guess, um, I don't know who said that quote, but I, you know, in thinking about kind of the Buddhist um, idea that su just suffering exists and that it's just a part of life and it's really about our response or attitude towards it. Um, I guess in some ways that could apply to that. There could be some connection with that idea with the quote. Uh, but I also think I, I wouldn't want anyone to um, feel that they're choosing suffering. Um, you know, I think that it, it exists and, and what we can choose is how we respond to it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And do you have resources on your website at Reasons EDC with more tools for self-compassion or places people can go to find more about it? Yeah. You know what? I don't know if we have things specifically on our website. I probably should put some things on there. That's a good reminder for that. Um, but um, certainly, um, Kristen Neff's website, I think, which I think is selfcompassion.org, has really amazing um, exercises and meditations and things. It's really user-friendly that you can go on and there's a self-compassion um, quiz you can take. And um, I would say that that's a really great resource. Um, there's also, um, I'll show you this book called Mindful Compassion. And um, this is by Paul Gilbert. And um, he has books on actually for like for therapists on compassion focused therapy, but this book mindful compassion is um, for the lay person and there's exercises in it and um, meditations and some really good information about how our brains work um, and um, how to understand shame and it's a really wonderful book. So I would, I would say this would be one of my top recommendations for a resource for something to read. Great. Yeah. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure having you with us today to discuss this topic and um, hopefully people now have a, a better idea of what self-compassion is. Mm -hmm. It's not for weenies. It's not, <laughs> right, you know, right. not going to mean you're going to be uh, mm -hmm. super ego and a lot of people can like confuse it with being inflated self-esteem. It's, right. it's really a great way to build more confidence in self. And Yeah. Well, any parting thoughts for us, Nikki? Um, I don't think so. I just encourage people to um, to explore this, to be curious about it. Um, and um, yeah, and I'm just grateful that, um, that you're doing this and holding space for these kinds of conversations that I think are, are really needed in our, in our world. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> As I always finish every Recovery Warrior show podcast with make compassion light the path you are on and courage keep you on it. So I think that's mm. fitting to finish yes. the session with. Thank you so much for being with Thank us you. today.